This is the Tabernacle Podcast with MJ, Martin Rizzi, and me, Adam Sharp. And I gotta say, Benji, I like the new intro. That's way better than sitting here for 45 minutes waiting for that to end. I mean, I like the music in the first place, but yeah, like it, you get right into the stuff. Like, yeah, it, it's good. I think, yeah. Cool. Well, what's up, Tab family? Uh, we are back. So uh, today we are joined once again by the one and only George Butler. And if you're listening to this, this is part two. If you didn't uh, notice that in the description, this is part two. So if you haven't listened to part one yet, because we're doing George's change life story and it's been uh, an incredible journey so far. If you haven't listened to part one, go back to podcast number 145, listen to part one, uh, and then come back and listen to this one so that you can get the full story. If I'm out there, like my first thought is don't tell me what to do. I'll listen to the latter half of his life and then I'll go back. <laughs> you would. I would. <laughs> you would. Do whatever but I want. if you want to hear some really awesome stuff, go back to 145. Yeah. Hopefully that number's right. If not, <laughs> just read till you see George Butler. George Butler. Butler. Sorry. <laughs> um, so George, thanks for coming back. We really appreciate you, you being here again. Uh, a few weeks back when we did your beginning life, the change, mm-hmm. change life story, beginning part. We got through college. Uh, we, we talked a lot about uh, just having joy and struggle. We talked a lot about prioritizing, uh, what I would call prioritize and execute, you know, because we're talking about where do you start yeah. when things are happening? How do you get started? How do you get going? Well, it's prioritize you. I think you gave the example of like financial freedom. Uh, like, yeah. what do you do when you have four credit cards? Pay the easy one off first and then start rolling with it, right? Prioritize and execute. Um, but where we ended was kind of your calling in college, your calling into pastoral ministry. And you began to, you, you mentioned some things that I thought were really cool that are worth at least repeating a little bit. Uh, you said something to the effect of God will gift you for the calling that he calls you to. And you began to see that in college and, and you began to, to pastor these people in college. And so uh, that's kind of where we had left off, uh, MJ. If I'm forgetting anything, but I think that's where we where we were. I mean, you can't summarize that. You got to go back and and listen to that yeah. whole podcast. But yeah, there was, and there was just an energy to the the entire conversation um, that was striking to me because as you know, early life hits, and as you're sorting through, you know, insecurities in life mm-hmm. that we all do, um, you're coming to this place where it's just an increasing realization of God's presence in your life. Um, so that was that was a ton of yeah. fun for me, but uh, I know that some people out there they just got hooked right on the uh, car that you mentioned, your dad's car, early in the <laughs> episode. So um, who knows what people will take from this? Yeah, yeah. So so you're in college. We'll just jump right back in if that's okay, George. Yeah, you're in college. You get this call in pastoral ministry. You begin uh, counseling people and sitting with people. Um, yeah, what happens next? So you're in college and you're doing this thing. Yeah. Confidence in Christ keeps on growing. I mean, I experienced Christ uh, even as a young man, as a student, but uh, that realization that I'm a zero, I know I said that numerous times last time, I am a zero, but Christ. (laughs) And when he starts making himself known to you and you learn how to sort of live under that umbrella of Christ and his empowerment, uh, life gets strong and courageous and bold and really exciting. So when God calls you to pastoral ministry and uh, gifts you for it, surprisingly, it's not like, oh, I've seen pastors before. I grew up with pastors, and I know what to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I never fit into what to do but to giftedness immediately. God called me, and pastorate is basically a shepherding, a caring for the people around you. You don't Mm -hmm. have to be the pastor of a church to have the pastoral gift. And so God called me to pastoral ministry, but right away uh, I started caring for the guys on my dormitory floor. I started caring for people in the uh, college choir. And... It's not like uh, I got invited into it. Right. 
And then God used it. They, they said, would you talk to me? And I'd talk to somebody, and God would, uh, would take over the conversation. And I knew it wasn't about me at all, but I better keep talking. But somewhere God entered in and, and helped people. So I started defining this gift. You, you read the list, list of gifts in Scripture, and you go, well, I don't see it there, but I call it encouragement. And uh, you know, I think another way I've described it over the decades is I seem to have an organized mind where I can lead people through their stuff. Mm -hmm. And again, God uses that. Mm -hmm. uh, God helps me to sort out where they're at, what they need, and God intervenes. It's not my structuring like how to be a pastor. Well, you'll wear a tie on you. Mm -hmm. No, it's nothing like that. I'm so glad. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Bench, I do that. I get excited and scream into the microphone. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> so, That's yeah, I'm at uh, college. I went to the, uh, the College of Gordon eventually. I mean, through a junior college first and then mm -hmm. Temple University in Philadelphia when God called me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I changed a couple courses. I was mid-year at, at, uh, at Temple. And so I took some religion courses at Temple. That was a joke. These are people mm -hmm. that don't believe in God at all, but they're teaching. <laughs> right. They'll teach you what somebody else believes. Yeah. <laughs> so now I'm at, I, I moved to Gordon because I wanted to go to their seminary. And, uh, and it was kind of a privilege because my, we'd taken my brother there a couple of years before, and I wasn't following my brother. But I studied what seminary do I want to go to, and I decided on Gordon. I actually had a couple classes with my brother. <laughs> so uh, all I needed when I got to Gordon College was upper divisional Bible stuff. Uh, because I'd done all my, I'd done three years of university. Now I had all my basics done. I just needed a Bible. Right. And so uh, it was kind of a miracle there in that uh, I was now a four year student, but uh, the college and seminary had the same length of term. And there were no upper divisional Bible classes there for me when I started my fourth year. I'd have to wait until the next year. So I asked if I could start seminary before I graduated from college. Mm. <laughs> Got the same length term. It made sense to me. Mm -hmm. And they'd never done it before, but they approved it. <laughs> so I took a first term of seminary, and then wow. I went back and graduated from college and continued wow. my seminary life. <laughs> and that day, Vietnam and, uh, was on pretty heavy. Yeah. And I picked up a deferment when I entered seminary. Uh, so... Uh, I didn't get drafted. I now had a 4D, a, a divinity deferment. And so that was nice uh, to kind of resolve that in my life. I could just press mm -hmm. on to do what God was calling me to do in seminary. So another thing happens. I'm on a college campus. College and seminary were on the same campus in that day, or I was still finishing college. And all these years I'd been at... Uh, uh, secular universities, uh, hanging out with ungodly men and women, <laughs> and the women. Now, I, I didn't date anybody in junior college. I didn't date anybody at Philadelphia, but I was looking forward to meeting a nice, godly woman. And so this is another life change to meet the mm -hmm. person you're going to marry. And this is a big deal. So while I had a lot of friends and fairly close friends of ungodly women, we never crossed a boundary there. For me, it was about ministry, uh, leading people toward Christ and something better. And my own disciplines, yeah, I'd be real happy to be with a woman, but no. Mm -hmm. no. Take it in God's order and God's time, but now I'm... There's a lot of beautiful Christian women around me. It was actually through the college choir where I met Kathy and uh, through a blizzard. Mm. Okay, you people that have experienced blizzards, okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> talk about this one. So uh, I 
had been uh, with a friend, actually Kathy's sister. Two of her sisters attended Gordon prior to her. Kathy was the youngest. And uh, her older sister was uh, dating a guy there that became a best friend to mine. And that's how I met Kathy and her family. And uh, so we were in the choir. Her older sister, Beth, was in the choir, and Kathy was in the choir. But this friend, this guy befriended me, and I don't know why. I almost think he wanted to set me up with this. His girlfriend's sister. Needed a wingman. I think he wanted to set me up. I don't know. But for some reason, he respected me. He was the... Uh, he was the president of the college choir, and he wanted me to be the president the next year. And it's essentially a pastoral bit, uh, but you also select who's going to be on the touring choir at the end of that year. So he wanted to meet with me. So we met over dinner, and there's he and his girlfriend, Beth, Kathy's sister, and Kathy. Hmm. Hello. So I kind of knew Kathy, although I was there with a friend. And then we had a blizzard. This sucker buried. Uh, it was a nor'eastern off Boston. And uh, you'd go out of the, I mean, it rained. I mean, it snowed hard for three days and it buried cars. You could go out in the parking lot and that day cars had antennas, <laughs> right? And you'd go out and uh, all you could see was antennas. You could not see a car wow. at all. They were all buried. Um, and so that was pretty cool. You, we were snowed in, baby. <laughs> and it was a big difficulty for uh, Eastern Massachusetts. Yeah, Eastern Massachusetts. So they had to helicopter in formulas for babies and stuff like that. And you couldn't clear the highway with plows. You had mm -hmm. to front end load it. Mm -hmm. And so it took uh, days to dig out. And I love snow driving. Oh, I love blizzards. <laughs> and um, matter of fact, in that blizzard uh, with a couple other guys, we just said, let's go pray on the other side of the pond. And the snow is trudging along its waist deep, uh, even when it seems to be blown clear. And we were coming up a, a little ridge at the end of going around. We had a prayer meeting on the far side. We we're coming up this hill, and I got blown over by the wind, and I love wind. <laughs> wind is my favorite thing in nature. Ah, Isn't it your least favorite thing? I hate the wind. Yeah. Yeah. We'd be backpacking on high peaks, and all my friends know this. So I'm out with a bunch of guys, and... And uh, the wind would about blow you over. Uh, I've been blown over twice in my life by the wind, and I'm just, ah! you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm crazy about wind. You give me a wind and you give me a blizzard, and I'm a happy You're guy. You're happy. All right. So I met, I really connected with Kathy in a blizzard. Okay. Because this friend Highland. Does uh, she feel the same way about wind and blizzards? Or is she normal like the rest of us? <laughs> uh, not so much wind. All right. Yeah, we're good for snow. Yeah. Um, yeah except I get a little over crazy when I have snow and wind. <laughs> <laughs> so even friends who are backpacking friends, and we've done high peaks, and I'm screaming on the top. <laughs> <laughs> and we've had time you were in a big backpack, and you're crossing over a, a, a narrow place, and the wind is blowing. It could blow you off the mountain. So you bend over to 45 and you don't dare pick up a foot because mm -hmm. you could get blown over. So you're just shuffling, going across, hunkered down so the wind doesn't blow you off the mountain. And I'm just, you know, ah, I'm just <laughs> loving this right in the geyser. So now they go backpack and I get a phone call. Guess where I'm at? Oh, I'm on the top of this mountain and it's windy, George. I was thinking <laughs> of you. you know? That's awesome. So for anybody out there that's like not from where we're from, recording this <laughs> george lives in the perfect place because we get blizzards and we get wind and in manistee off the lake i've got to imagine that's just all the time so the wind is good blizzards not so much anymore yeah the last big snow i saw was when i lived in uh in Ludington or Muskegon, I forget. I think it was Ludington. Uh, i came home driving busting drifts driving home and i just socked my car into my driveway and it was hood deep 
Leave it I there. Just, I just socked it into the driveway. I got home. I had a young family. We had to roll the window down and I had to bail out. Wow. And get to my garage and come shovel to get my family into the house. And go, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that doesn't happen anymore. It's pretty wimpy around here. Yeah. On to so the you sp- go to this prayer meeting on the other side of the pond, right? Yeah. Is that okay? You're yeah. Treading through the snow to do this? Oh, yeah, baby. Okay. Blown over by the wind. Yeah. So back to the. Kathy, so yeah. we have this big blizzard where you can't see anything but antennas. And finally, first road opens up, and this friend Highland, he's, he's kind of crazy like I am. And uh, he comes driving across campus. Campus is now sort of dug out and a road. And so he's driving along with his girlfriend and with Kathy. And I'm walking across campus. He rolls the window. You want to go for a ride? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So now um, his girlfriend, Beth, hops in the back with Kathy, and I'm in the front seat so as to not be, like, partnered up, right? And we just start going for rides uh, a couple days in a row. We go out to a, an IHOP and, you know, have a pancake or whatever, and so I'm getting to know Kathy. At the end of the week, uh, I invited her to a concert on campus, and that was our first date. But Kathy, for a life change, um, it didn't take me long at all to realize uh, that, yeah, she's the one. And uh, so for me, uh, not only because I'm a zero, I wasn't feeling that anymore. I'm pretty self-confident. But uh, half the marriages end up in divorce, and I never want to deal with that down the road. I want to marry somebody who's going to be loyal, faithful. And I sense that in Kathy. And there's another thing I was after uh, specifically, and that's if either of our parents ever needed uh, care at an older age, I wanted them to be able to come into our home. I wanted a woman who would agree to that. Kath, Mm. If your mom or my mom, you know, usually the men die first, right? Need to live with us. I want that to happen. Part of that comes from I grew up with uh, a grandma who lived with us when I was a little kid, when I was four and five years old. (laughs) Grandma lived a couple husbands, you know. Uh, But she outlived her first husband, and she was living with us when I was, uh, I think when I was four, it was before I was in kindergarten. And Grandma meant the world to me, and to my brother, my older brother, older sister. We would just want to be the first one to come down in the morning and pour Grandma's tea for her at breakfast. Hmm. Uh, She would walk me to school when I went to kindergarten. When the older brother, I was bratty little brother. My sister's already with the Lord, but uh, (laughs) she would go, yeah, you were a pain, George. (laughs) You always wanted to be where your older sister was and butt into her business and stuff like that. So they would run off on me and hide on me, you know, go ditch George. And little kid, that would break my heart, and I'd go to Grandma. Grandma would say, well, here, under the kitchen table, go up there and lay under there on the chairs while I'm baking chocolate chip cookies. And I'd go lay under there, huddled, hiding with Grandma, hiding from my brother and sister, if you will, till Grandma puts the chocolate chip cookies down under the table. Hmm. I mean, Grandma was a big deal. And, uh, you know, to have that multi-generational, and prior to that, I hardly knew her, but when I was two or three, my dad's mom, lived with us for a bit while she was dying, and I think she died in her home. And all I knew about her is she was a little old, tiny lady, just decreased in size for old age, and we played Chinese checkers. That's all I remember about her. Little later, little lady with a gray bun, played Chinese, that's all I know about her. And she lived in a front room somewhere. So this was a value that was instilled in you and through Uh your family at a young age wasn't drilled into me, but I experienced how wonderful. Yeah. 
And I always wanted to do that if one of our parents had any. We never did. So in marriage, I wanted somebody who would never divorce me. And that means, by comparison, you'd meet some flirty girls <laughs> that think they're just too good for everybody else. And you perceive they might think they're too good for me at some point. And I don't want that. I want somebody that's happy with who they are. And, well, maybe not happy, but they know who they are and they don't, they're not pretentious. They're not after mm -hmm. something more. And, and that's me. Um, I don't think I'm too good for my wife. My wife doesn't think she's too good for me and we're not going to move on. So I'm looking for that person. And with Kathy, I sensed that she was like me, if you will, in those values especially, and that we were like a piece of a puzzle that fit. She fit me. Uh, she even looked like my family, long blonde hair, you know. Uh, that's who we were. We were just blonde people who grew up in a certain Christian culture and understood Christ and we just seemed to fit, and uh, and she was pretty, <laughs> and she looked young, and I thought she'll always look young. She'll always be pretty to me, and she is. When we married, she looked like she was maybe sixteen at the most. <laughs> <laughs> is she? How much younger is she than you? Uh, she's uh, two years younger than me. Okay, all right. Robbing the cradle. Yes, sir. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So she just fit, and uh, she knew from the get-go that I was pastoral, of course, and she and her sisters all agreed they're all preacher's kids. Mm. They all agreed that they never wanted to marry a pastor because they, they lived next door to the church, and they mm. were put on display. And three girls were a trio. They all... They were all musical. They got all sing. Kathy was the pianist. She'd play and the trio would sing when people came into the house and it was that performance kind of thing that she didn't like. Two of them did marry full time. <laughs> Pastoral type people. And had the hardship. There's some hardship that goes with that. There's some expectations that go with that from some churches. And so Kathy's had to live with that, embrace it, you know, uh, as a Christ follower, but still always wonder, you know, do I have to fill out the pastoral role? Mm. Like I said, put on the necktie and do the whatever yeah. you're supposed to do. There's a large fear of that, I find. Mm -hmm. um, I think both of our wives, at least at some point, have communicated, like, the idea of being a pastor's wife yeah. was a title in itself that they weren't sure that they were qualified for, wanted. Um, yeah. And, you know, Cassie and I often joke about it just because it is, it is different here at the Tabernacle. I'm yeah. really, really grateful for that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a little bit less of a glass house, even though we do literally live across the street from the church. Yeah. But there's, there's a lot there and there's some baggage that goes along mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. um, but you found a way to sell around it anyway. Uh, I didn't sell around that. She I was don't. just madly in love. Got me. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, she's just a Christ follower. and uh, But, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. You, when you marry a girl who's a pianist and you come as a pastor to a church, they go, oh. Two for one. So she's been a pianist everywhere I've served. She's been a choir director. She's been an ensemble leader. She's been a worship team leader. Uh, and she's pretty good on piano and Manistee. She's played for the civic players when they do musicals and accompanist and stuff like that. So is she's, Victoria aware of this? Hmm? Is Victoria aware of this? <laughs> um, <clears throat> probably not. And it's okay. She is aware of it because Kathy's not doing that kind of stuff now. Gotcha. That's fair. But, uh, and, and piano's a part of it. I grew up in a piano family, um. Uh, three of us all took piano lessons. Dad was uh, a piano player. And uh, yeah, so we just grew up 
around piano, and uh, I quit after about five years of piano. Uh, uh, but I love it, and I've restored pianos, I've refinished pianos, I've hung out with people who uh, every church I've been at, you come in and they've got some pretty sorry pianos. And you need to get a piano regulator to come in and rebuild that sucker. And I've always worked alongside of them and just love piano. It's, uh, I don't want to go to an orchestra, but if there's a piano concerto, count me in, you know, hmm. I'm, that's awesome. I'm a that's piano cool. lover. So what, what year of college is this that you meet Kathy then? It's Are my you, fourth year. Your fourth year. It's her freshman year. Okay. So you're, you're in college, you meet Kathy. You're getting ready to leave college then, pretty shortly after. Uh, yes, uh, well, okay. but, but it's on the same campus, and uh, okay. when it changes campus, it's only uh, two miles away. Okay, I'm living on campus because now I'm an RA, a resident assistant, mm -hmm. and so I lived there until we married. Uh, we married after my first year of seminary, on her graduation day. Oh, cool. Hmm. Well, no. <laughs> no, not cool. Not cool. <laughs> Sounds very inconvenient if I'm <laughs> Kathy. Oh. Kathy never got to walk. Oh. And so I had a summer job for a YMCA camp that I, this was going to be my fifth or sixth year at the same camp. And uh, it started five days after her graduation date. And so it was going to be our honeymoon that five days if she could... Hmm. If we could get married on her graduation day. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very like good Christian kids get married. Everything happens quick. Like we're going to make this thing work. And then, yeah. so uh, hold on. I got to, we, we skipped a part that I feel is important. I would like to know how you proposed to Kathy. Ah, had to do with a blizzard, had to do with a piano. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> oh, yeah. So uh, her senior recital. Okay. Is the day we became engaged. And uh, it was on campus at the college chapel, and uh, she was going to perform there. Oh, and by the way, so while she was rehearsing for that, I would just, I would Go, she would be rehearsing in the chapel, and I would go in to study while she's there. I couldn't mm -hmm. study while I'm listening. I'm devouring the piano and her expertise on it. And some of the pieces she was working on, she would just hammer a phrase over and over and over again. And it was just sinking into my heart, and I'm just loving it, her discipline, her mastery of those passages, memory of stuff. And uh, at any rate, so we're at that same chapel. It's her senior recital. Um, this friend uh, and his, and Kathy's sister, Highland and Beth, uh, Highland's made the arrangements. Uh, we have tuxes, the two of us, and the girls are, Kathy's wearing a gown, of course, she's performing. And we're going to go out to a big restaurant afterwards. And I've got a rose and I've got a ring. And uh, so Kathy finishes her performance, uh, greets the few people that can make it in the blizzard. So when she first started this hour-long performance or whatever, there was about four inches on the ground. By the time we came out, there was about 12 inches on the ground. Mm -hmm. But uh, she finished her performance, and the crowd cleared a little bit, and I went with a rose and a ring and one knee by the piano and asked her to marry me, and she said yes. And So on that day, the, you ring the bell on the college chapel if there's a, or near the college chapel if there's an engagement. So we tromped through the snow. And with a, they took the clapper out of this thing so it wouldn't be rung all the time or yeah. students stole it, I'm not sure. So you take, a, <laughs> you take a tire iron and bang, you hit that, and everybody knows there's been an engagement. And then we go downtown Boston to a restaurant called The Ship. It's really a, a big sailing vessel design and quite a nice place. And because of the blizzard, we're about the only people there. Yeah. So That's awesome. Like that. Yeah. You know, I, l I love just hearing how you talked about like her playing the piano. Yeah. Because 
I don't have an affinity for the piano, nor do I know Kathy that well. Yeah. But you can see how he loves her through how he talks about her playing the piano. I'm just thinking there's a bunch of guys out there that should probably be taking notes because uh, I don't know that I've ever conveyed uh, how much my I love watching my wife cut hair, or any of her passions in life, the way that you conveyed that. Um, and if she listens to this podcast, I'll probably get in trouble for that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't love Kathy because she plays the piano, but, and like I said, that's a hindrance when you come into a church. It's an expectation. Yeah, yeah, uh, she's yeah. happy to use what she's good at, but mm -hmm. at the same time, that expectation yeah. uh, has camped out on her, but so For sure. I'm glad she's come with me in my career, my calling. Yeah. She's a secondary music education uh, teacher as her what she studied and she did that for two years and then go no that's not for me mm -hmm. uh, uh, in music education then in, in Massachusetts you go they put together two classes of 30 students for a music class and um, that's middle school and they're at least as big as you are Kathy's mm -hmm. only 5'2 yeah <laughs> And they're, they don't care to be there. <laughs> right. And Kathy lived through two years of that. We just taped her together every day to send her back in the battle. It was hard. Oh, gosh. So I was doing two years yet of seminary after we married, and she okay. was teaching. And then uh, the first contact for going into pastoral ministry, which was pretty delicious. But that's sort of a part of life change because at the end of seminary, I grew up ABC, American Baptist Convention, which is very liberal and very conservative, and sometimes they alternate pastors like that. I mentioned I mm -hmm. at first had a very liberal pastor, and then yep. I had a very conservative pastor, and that's, you don't know how you fit, yeah, really, with ABC, but my brother was doing field education when he was at seminary at a, a Baptist General Conference, or Converge now, and I went with Kathy a couple times to his church, just see where he's at. And whew, that church was different. It's like walking into Tab when you've been at other churches and you go, whoa, <laughs> this is where I want to be. And so I experienced that with another group that's very much like Tab, very much like E-Free, the Baptist General Conference. Grew out of Swedish immigration. They're not divisive people. They're peace, mm -hmm. peaceful people like their culture. They're not negative. They're not focused on small issues. They're loving Christ and loving one another and making disciples, the things we're doing here at TAB. Nice. And I experienced that and uh, a church that knew how to welcome a visitor and take you in and take care of you. You heard just once. And you're accepted, you're included, you're welcomed. So I limited my placement to Baptist General Conference in New England. I went to the executive director of New England in the Converge, and uh, he interviewed me, and uh, he recommended me to his brother, who was a pastor in one of the churches. So I went and candidated there. And as I did, I was to, to be there one weekend and then come two weekends later for another weekend. That church didn't know it, but on the in-between, our pastor was on vacation, but he was candidating in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And he told me that. He said, George, if I accept a call elsewhere, would you still come to this church? Would you still serve here? I said, no. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to be on a multi-staff, multiple staff. All my career, that was my desire. I don't care where on the position, but I want to be in a multi. I want to work in a team. And uh, so I said, "No, I won't come where I don't know who I'm working with." First out of the gate. Hmm. And so he said, "I accepted that call in Detroit, and uh, would you come work with me there?" And I said, "Yeah." Hmm. What? Now he was converged. He was Baptist General Conference. And he had, uh, he was known for his ability to work uh, multiculturally. 
uh, among various people groups in a city environment. And he's going to Detroit. Hmm. And uh, so I had a hard regard for the guy, how he was known, what he was about. And I valued that enough to say, yeah, I limited my place to New England, but no, Detroit's fine. Let's go. And so uh, that was the first ministry was in Detroit. How, how was Kathy with that, with going, okay, we're going to Detroit? <laughs> I don't know that I ever asked. Oh, boy. <laughs> and he's still married. I don't know. <laughs> Amazing. You see why I need somebody who won't give yeah. up on me? <laughs> right. See, this talks about prior proper planning. Because he's like, all right, I'm going to make sure she's not going to leave me because I'm about to do some things. I'm going yeah, yeah. to make some bad decisions. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want any chance of her walking away. That's smart, George. I'm, I'm listening. Nah. I'm paying attention here. No, I'm not sure that I process that well or not. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I don't know. Yeah. That's the nice thing about looking back is, hey, maybe did, maybe didn't. She's still there. Yeah. <laughs> you stepped into pastoral ministry in Detroit. So, so how does this go? Is this a, a remarkable experience for you? Is it trying? Um, and you know, you're still pretty young in this. Uh, we got a lot of life story left to get, and yeah. it. But you're in Detroit right now. Yeah, and it's the beginning to the next life change, which we after marriage will become church planting. Okay. So when you connect with well, first of all, this guy in Detroit, oh, good work ethic, got me off to a good start. Uh, multicultural, a church that was Swedish origin, Baptist General Conference, had some Swedish speakers still in it, mm. all Anglo. And uh, we just start reaching out to our whole neighborhood. I mean, door to door. You could visit at homes in that day. Uh, church had a bus route. A uh, guy who worked uh, with Jewel Tea Company, it was door-to-door -door sales, and so he developed a bus route out of that, and I got I got to visit in those homes because he'd opened those doors mm -hmm. and work with the youth. I was a youth and outreach guy. And so I got to work, uh, you know, in, in the whole culture. Now, this is like five years after the Detroit riots. It's still fairly tense, but I never lived in that fear. I, I, I mean, it was smart. You didn't walk certain places mm -hmm. at certain hours of the day, but I was out in the whole community loving everybody, and he was too. And after a bit, we had African Americans attending, we had Chinese attending, we had Filipinos attending, uh, we had a Jewish man attending, a believer in Christ. Uh, and we were into it for a, a couple of years, and he says to me one day, so, so uh, how are we getting away with this? You know, in this church that's been all, how do you think we're getting away with this? I go, I don't know. <laughs> he said, well, just keep pretending it's okay and keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> that was the strategy. I like it. And eventually, uh, African-American uh, leaders in the church, and uh, it felt like the League of Nations. It just felt beautiful. I don't know that I've ever been in a setting that felt so beautiful in that way. And... Uh, Loving people, loving. So, you know, I grew, I had a pretty Anglo experience in my life, you know. <laughs> um, and after Detroit, uh, I served up north here, you know, Muskegon, Ludding, well, Muskegon Heights. But I grew up in a fairly Anglo culture, and I always missed what we had in Detroit. It was so beautiful. So in my next step, we life changed became church planting, and I'll take you there, but we planted multicultural churches. Yeah, hello, baby. And it felt good. But when you come in and converge, their big value was church planting because they realized that church planting is the most effective form of evangelism. Existing churches were formed maybe in that way, reaching new people in the community, but Still, 90% of any community you're going to shake a stick at are unbelievers. And how do you address them? The best way to address them is church planning. You move in among them, 
you establish uh, relationships where you're leading people to Christ. You bring them into small groups. You bring them into a bigger group, a church, and uh, you evangelize your community. That's what church planning is about for Baptist General Conference. You don't create another McDonald's to have a product. Uh, you're about seeing people come to Christ. Evangelistic church planning. Oh, yeah. So I came into that culture, even in my life in Detroit, but I'm also coming multiculturally uh, alive. And uh, I came on a national scene, sort of, uh, be just because I had a title. I was pastor of youth and outreach. Well, someone read that outreach in my job description and said, hey, would you come on a national team to... Uh, to teach on uh, youth ministry, and would you take the outreach component on that, how we bring that forward? And so we wrote a manual uh, that we circulated throughout Baptist General Conference churches, and we did seminars around the country. I was out probably four or five times a year to some church in some other district, and we're gathering people and presenting on youth ministry. And so for me on outreach, teaching, and uh, also getting familiar with uh, the nation of BGC and other districts and that kind of stuff. So it got me off to a fast start on outreach. So you put together that outreach segment and uh, the ability to communicate uh, in seminar format, how to, how to teach, how to teach my Sunday school class back home without being a, a boring dud, you know. <laughs> so I'm picking up those skills and uh, and I've got that heart for church planting. And even back then in Detroit, uh, some of our people were moving out, and could we plant a church out there with their with that core group in that next community? And the lead pastor, he had that vision of, no, we want that to support the inner city ministry that can't really support itself well. And I appreciated that. I, I had no argument. This guy's really good at what he does. But I knew I felt differently. I knew I wanted to plant a church. I knew I wanted to be evangelistic like that. And so I've been like six years in Detroit, and now I moved to Muskegon. And those three years I was in Muskegon, it was a different church setting. There were four of us on staff, four pastors. I, again, was one of the associates, and uh, but I'm praying about church planting. I started. That church was a little rough. Uh, the church was trying to chew up and get rid of the lead pastor. I had a good time there within my responsibilities. Uh, we had a big team of like five leaders in college ministry, five in senior high, five in middle school, and we were clicking. We were we were doing some good ministry there, but eventually uh, it's the ship lost the sails. Just nothing's happening. But I've been praying about church planting my three years there and trying to do stuff like church planters do, bring people together, be evangelistic. So I'd get a friend who's a good concert guy, guitar singer or songwriter, and we would uh, – um, Put together a format, see who comes, see see who we break conversations with, and get something going. And uh, so, trying, but again, without Christ, you're a zero. Mm -hmm. If God's not in it, it ain't gonna happen. So you're wanting, and God's leading in the wants. You understand that that's a good form of evangelism, and you want in on it. That's a good thing. You want to in on what. God will use and is using. But the interesting thing then was the transition when I got, when Jesus took over and did a church plant. Three years I'm praying. This church is in trouble. I'm in Muskegon. There's a church in Ludington that goes, they're looking for a youth guy. And they go, you know, maybe George is in trouble down there. Maybe he needs to get out of there. And I don't know it yet. Um, 
No, things aren't going good here yet, but, you know. But then two weeks later, I realized, uh, yeah, yeah, the ship's just going down. Called him back and said, well, yeah, maybe. So I candidated there, and I came on as associate pastor. And three months later, the lead pastor leaves to go elsewhere, and I become the interim pastor. And three months later, I become the senior pastor. We call in an associate who's an older pastor. And, uh, but here's, here's what's more important. When I'm candidating there, the lead pastor says to me, I want you to have lunch on Sunday with a dissident family. Oh, I want you to know the good and bad of this church before you come here. Dissident, he called them. So I go out to Tom and Sally's home, and we have a nice lunch. And Tom says, so I want to know what's the possibility of us planting a church out here in Victory Township? I said, well, Tom, we'll pray and we'll see what God will do. And that's always the formula. You've got to see what God will do. You don't go do something. But I meant it. Some people will say, yeah, sure, we'll pray about it. Oh, no. This is what I've been praying about. And here's a guy who says, can we do it here? So we'll pray and we'll see what God will do. I start praying. I don't know. It's a few weeks later I come up. Uh, I commuted for a couple of weeks from Muskegon to Ludington to come up on the weekend. My very first Sunday, the very first day, I think it was probably a Monday or a Tuesday, I forget, when the office is open, I come to the office. My very first day there, the lead pastor had just led a guy from Victory Township to Christ. I'm walking into the office. These two are walking down the same hallway. This man, Bernie, is out of his mind for having just accepted Christ. This is a, a quiet, hidden man that's now crazy about Christ in his life. He's heading across the study to talk to his coffee and donut bunch about what happened in his life. And this is totally uncommon for him. I walk in. We're praying about what God will do in Victory Township about planting a church. This man's from Victory. This is my first moment mm -hmm. walking into that church as a staff member and lead pastors just led this guy from Victory Township to the Lord. Two weeks later, I, uh, I moved there, and three guys from Victory Township helped unpack my home and helped me move in. It's this guy, Bernie, and his son and his son-in-law from Victory Township. So I'm interim, and then I'm the lead pastor, and the first three people that I lead to Christ in that community are from Victory Township. And I don't go out. They come into my office. And they're troubled. We lead them through their troubles, see them come to know Christ. And they're from Victory Township. One of our deacons is a snowbird. He's going to Florida for a couple of months, and he's from, he's got a guy from Victory Township, Bernie, this first guy. And I say, Don, can I take over your Bible study till you come back? Yeah, sure. And can we move it to Bernie's house in Victory Township? Hmm. Yeah, that'd be fine. We go to Bernie's house, and nothing big happens there except one guy comes to know Christ, and he's from Victory Township. And I'm just seeing, oh, so I'm burning wood at my home, and I order logs, and a guy comes to delivery, eight-foot logs, and he dumps them, and boom, he knocks out the corner post of my front porch. It's okay, the roof stays up. <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm busy. I'm busy in ministry, and a guy goes, hey, uh, I'll come by and we'll, this is a four square out of, we're going to rebuild this out of two by six uh, green lumber. And hey, would you come up? When can we, uh, I don't know. 
can you come out? Okay, I'll come out on this day. And we come out there and we rebuild this post and we put it in. And while it's a burden for me to want to do this, I'm doing with, with this guy from Victory Township. And mm-hmm. We're talking Christ and we're talking about the village. And uh, at that time, uh, I felt led to, uh, again, in my own evangelism, to call on God. It's my principle that if God's in it, so I, I make a list of by faith. This is something I'm teaching across the country on outreach and evangelism. I say if you know reaching your circle of influence, kind of things for Christ. So I'm going okay. So how about for me? Who's who's in my circle of influence? that I have contact with that doesn't know Christ, and I think God will, God will bring them in. So I list 10 people. It's in July 1. I said, God, will you? I begin to pray every day for this list of 10, that they will come to know Christ by the end of the year. <laughs> and uh, we're getting near the end of the year, and eight people have accepted Christ. And I had two more people on the list, and they've come to know Christ. And uh, we're, we're very near the end of the year, and there's a woman, the, as soon as I put her on the list, she went to live in Detroit, and I have no more contact with her. I'm still praying that she'll come to know Christ. In Detroit, her boyfriend beat her nearly to death. And her two brothers go down to pick her up and bring her home. And the next day she's in my office, deep into December, to accept Christ. (sighs) A lot of these people are from Victory Township. And now I create a new, well, there's another guy who wants to create a Bible study, and it's in the next uh, adjoining township. It's in Hamlin Township. I go, oh, rats. <laughs> he puts together about a dozen people, and I go, and I'm a part of that. He's leading it. And we're studying spiritual gifts. And everybody goes, yeah, I don't think I, yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, they have no concept of this. People are very young in Christ. By the time we're done, we, it's like the empty chair. Everybody goes around and comments on the giftedness that they see in the other persons, and people are identifying their giftedness, and it's powerful. And most of those people became leaders in the church plant. Hmm. And God planted a church. And so back home, uh, I have lists from time to time on my debt. We're, we're doing construction on an addition on the church that I'm at. We've got a lot of builders, and they're doing their thing. And I'm, I'm busy doing evangelism. I got a list on my desk one day. I remembered I listed five people that I thought could come to Christ this week. <clears throat> and it's a busy week, so it's up till Thursday. And there's jackhammering going on in the building, and I got to get out of there. And it's Thursday, and it's my first outing. I go to a home, and I'm talking to people. They they want to know about Christ, and they got questions. And man, I'm I'm there a couple of hours. They won't let me go, and I go. You know, my wife's kind of expecting me for dinner. Uh, <laughs> I should probably go. You can't go. Okay, and so we stay longer, and it's now another hour or so longer, and uh, I go, you know, I should really, you can go if you promise to come back tomorrow, and I come back tomorrow, I lead that couple to Christ, and I never made it to the next three that week, but over the next weeks I did, and it's like, here's my description, Okay. I live near a beach, and you go to a beach early in the morning or after a rain, there's no footprint on it, you know what I'm saying? 
This is just a picture of how God was leading them that day. You imagine a, a left footprint appears in front of you, and you know you're to follow. You put your left foot into the left footprint, and then there's a right, and you put your right into that. And this is occurring right in front of you, and you just keep doing that, and now you're at a running pace, and you're running with the Spirit. You know the phrase, keep in step with the Spirit of God? This was wild. This was wild. Created four evangelistic Bible studies one summer. 26 people came to know Christ. I'm still a zero, okay? I did not plant the church. Christ did. Christ drew people to himself. He sent them into my office. He puts them on my list. He gives me the list. I pray for them. I make the contact, but God does what? Mm. When you get obedient to Christ, he's powerful about his will. You got to get out from what your will is, what you want. Get into what God wants and pursue it. And it's just, you know. George, what you said right there was powerful. Yeah. When you get outside of your will and into God's will, what he does is powerful. Yeah. And I can say uh, from a couple of guys still stumbling into this ministry world, um, that's more of a challenge than I think I'd like to admit that it is on any given day. But I sit here for the last 15 minutes watching the tears well up in your eyes and still remembering the names, probably the addresses, the people whose homes you were invited into, and in some cases it seems like held hostage within, mm -hmm. um, yeah. as you share Christ with them. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> in the time that I've known you, I've seen one intrinsic quality that has, has always been noticeable, and it's just the fact that you are so passionate about what God's doing in your life. Um, it has been remarkable to, to hear from the beginning of this story that that's always been there. That's pretty much always been a key aspect of it. Like you were passionate about it as a child. You were passionate about it when you were accepted Christ. You were passionate yeah. about it in college. Uh, whether it's your wife's piano or it's what Christ is doing in that moment, mm -hmm. there's a passion that God has placed on your heart, and it's pretty remarkable. And I've gotten to see the latter years, right? Like the mm -hmm. the well after the fact. Uh, I couldn't imagine what it was like during that time when you started to see those footprints increase, that speed and the pace, the keeping in step start to ramp up. Um, because I'm sitting here looking at a guy that I've known for a relatively short time. And I, I remember distinctly one of my favorite moments with you, and it was you kind of talking about what was next. And I don't want to jump too much of your story, so I won't go into that, but I still remember looking up and going, that guy is more passionate at, let's call it a later stage in life than I may have ever been about anything in my life. So I, I just want to thank you before we even finish for that piece and just showing it so clearly as you walk through this church planting process. Yeah. But I'm curious. So, so you've, you've now been a part of your first church plant and it sounds like you've got kind of caught the fever. Like this is something that's, you want this to be a part of. And I, I can see how there's a connection to where you are today, but in that time period, like how did you, how did you continue to go that? Because I'm, I'm assuming that you weren't seeing five people come to Christ every week for the rest of your life. Right. Let me fill in two gaps, and I'll pick that up. Yeah. Uh, the two gaps being um, where that passion came from, and the second being I'm still a zero uh, in other things. Um, the passion from a young age, I, I mentioned all my Sunday school teachers. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Williams in the cradle, Mrs. Albick in toddlers, Mrs. Long in elementary, um, Mrs. Albick in middle school, Mrs. Brombacher in high school, and my pastor in later high school, Even Jones. These people just poured in 
the Bible to me, and I just believed the Bible. And uh, these are real stories, and God's doing real things with very real people, very normal people. And from a younger age, I don't know what age exactly, but I said to myself, or I said to the Lord, so God, you've dealt with a lot of average people. Uh, you can deal with me because I'm not going away. Hmm. God's real. He deals with people and does wonderful things, and I'm not going to go away. When I came to pastoral ministry, a similar statement, uh, I said, God, when you called Solomon to be king of the nation of Israel, I said, how do I do that? God said, ask anything you want. So God, you told him to ask anything you want. So God, you got to play fair with me. I, I, I don't mean that harshly. I just mean yeah. your character has to be there in the same way for me. Uh, so he probably asked best, or he certainly asked best for wisdom for what he needed. I'm asking for faith. Give me faith to follow and to do your work and the works to accompany the faith. And for the people I work among, give them faith, God, and the ability to live according to that faith, to live it out. Mm-hmm. So my passion's always been there, poured into me from Scripture, what I see in Scripture, what I experience there, and I'm going to live in that. I'm going to live in the context of the Bible. I'm going to live that way. And so it just seems obvious. But if God's who he is and he deals with people, and I'm taught to do this. And so when you first experience Christ, experience him, it's hello, look at that. And I, I rehearsed those in my first time. When you're pursuing joy and he like overflows and makes you crazy, or joy never leaves you and continues to. Now you're asking what he wants to love people the way God loves people. And you go, oh, I need to pray and pursue that. And a few years later, you find yourself saying, I think I love everybody. I just haven't met them all yet. Mm. <sighs> and so what you maybe don't know about me is right behind me all the time, uh, there's sort of a photograph, not a photo, a, a poster board. It's like two feet by three feet. And the bottom half is sand, sand colored. The top half is blue, blue sky. And every time God does something, obviously God, no coincidence involved. I drive a golf flag into the sand in that picture. And it's got a little triangular flag, and it's about four feet tall. And I say to myself, don't ever forget this. So when I pray for joy and God brings about that radical change in my life, and I go, is this because you wanted it? Is this because you hope for it? Is this because you believe you've changed? Is this because? Look at it from every angle possible. And if this is absolutely from God, drive a golf flag in. Because when you're 85 years old sitting in your rocking chair saying, mm -hmm. is God real at all? Do, yeah. Did I live a false life? Hmm. Remember that. I, I've got... I don't know, major flags. I've got 15 major flags driven in. Couldn't possibly be anything but God. Uh, and, and plenty of minor, minor tribes, just flags, just a one church plant, you know. Mm -hmm. So my faith is strengthened and affirmed and bolder and bolder to trust in God and zero in George. <laughs> Now, when I was moving in that church planning, I became a, a workaholic. Danger, flash, flash, okay, George is nowhere near the pretty picture. Only, that's only half the story, okay. So when these guys called me to Ludington to be their 
youth guy and then interim and then senior pastor. I said, well, so you, you can be our senior pastor, but would you keep being the youth pastor too? Because you're doing a good job over there. <laughs> okay. <sighs> and then all of a sudden, God is calling you to be the church planter as well. So you're the youth guy, you're the lead pastor, you're the church planter. And you're doing stuff that normal people do too. Mm -hmm. I'm a home remodeler, and so I've got a big project going on in my home. And I decide I don't want to fall behind in credential kinds of stuff, and so I do my D-min. This is overload. Mm -hmm. And I'm in trouble. And I'm running hard in evangelism. I'm the quick change artist. You know, downtown I dress one way. But I'm out there in Victory Township. Yeah, you put on the Western boots and the jeans and off you go. I'm changing. I'm visiting. I'm running myself ragged from my list. From my, uh, I'm, I'm in trouble now, and I know it. And I'm working a profound number of hours. And while I'm working on my D-men, this is crazy, but I, just before that, I have, I have two weeks of vacation. I'm going to try to slow down. But I helped my brother-in-law move a guy in a hurricane, and I helped another brother-in-law put a roof on his house. And it didn't slow down a lot. And I drove home from vacation, and now I had two weeks of independent study. I was going to go out to the seminary campus, a 14-hour drive away, and, and try to do some study and try to slow down. But I literally drove home for vacation, got my family there at night. I was, the drive in me was insane. I was going to drop my family off at night and drive 14 hours back to the Boston area without sleeping. It's the drive. I mean, I'm just stupid crazy. I, I did sleep, and then I drove back to seminary that long drive early in the day, and I roll in there, and the director of my program comes out, and I'm addressing him about what I'm going to do. He says, George, where are you staying? Well, I'm staying with my friend Ray and Shirley. Why don't you go home and sleep and come see me tomorrow, he says. Well, I see him tomorrow. He goes, George, I looked at you, and you were dead standing up. You're in trouble. I go, yeah. And I walked into another department head where I was going to do a D-Men project with the youth ministry. <laughs> Big project. And I'm, he says, wait, let me get to know you first. You're doing what? You're what? You're, you're lead pastor. You're doing youth ministry. You're a D-Men student. You're planting a church. He says, what are you trying to get rid of? <laughs> That phrase changed my life. What are you trying to get rid of? I go, I don't know what he said after that. He kept talking, but I tuned out. Hmm. What are you trying? And I'm thinking, oh, I want to get rid of youth ministry. I don't want to do what I'm about to recommend to you. I need to get out of here and get in that stress and conflict seminar. <laughs> <laughs> God reached into my heart. And he killed that drive that was killing me. Hmm. He did. I don't know how I excused myself, but I walked out of there laughing out loud. And I sat down on a stone wall. And I go, I'm changed. I mean, I did stuff like take off my watch and other things to try to slow it down. God reached in and rescued me. And I was changed. And I knew it. And uh, I sat down for a half hour of prayer, just praising the Lord for that. I called Kathy. Kathy, God killed the drive. She said, we'll see. <laughs> Kathy's way smarter than I am. I'm in every sense. So I go home and I'm trying to deal with this new life. Okay, now it means I'm going to change my behaviors. And I'm going to go, okay, what's your ideal? How many hours do you want to work? And I go, well, a lot of guys work 40 or 48 hours. 
and then have the church ministry on top of that. So, okay, maybe 60 hours. Maybe I want to back off to 60 hours. And so all I did was log my time every half hour for the next two weeks. I didn't count it up yet, but I backed off considerably. And I think it was still at 66 hours. Backing off considerably. So I backed off more. All of a sudden, I've got a day off. I'm sitting in the barber shop, going to my friend Ron. So Ron, what do you do on your day off? Mm. I don't have a clue anymore. What do you do with your wife? You know. So you can be that stupid while you're responding to Christ. Who's that strong? Do you follow me? <sighs> Just got to stay under that umbrella where God's at. Boy, going out into the rain. <laughs> so the passion's there. George is still there. <laughs> <laughs> Get under that umbrella. Put your foot down where his footsteps are. Life's good. Now I can get to your transition. <laughs> no, that's, I'm grateful for that statement, <clears throat> that yeah. interjection more than anything, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've learned that God works through our cracks more than mm. what looks shiny. Yeah. How many, when you, when you get to this point, how many years in the ministry are you at that point? That you're talking about now? Uh, that was about 35 years ago when God cured of that workaholism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. That church plant. Yeah. <laughs> so, so God, God. I was going to say, I'm trying to math. I am bad at this, but so you had been doing ministry for quite a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So God changes your life in that aspect. And, and I'm sure um, Kathy and your family is quite appreciative of that. Mm -hmm. um, but you do continue in the ministry and continue planting churches. Uh, I was I director of church planting, and yep. I was new into a position that wasn't funded yet. So <laughs> that was a part of what was difficult for the family. Mm -hmm. So I did about five interims to raise my income during that period of time. I mean, I was paid on salary by the district, but yeah, I needed to help bring money in. So I worked about five interims. Uh, usually being away on Sunday and sometimes an overnight in that community where there's housing providers. So it's work Sunday and Monday and then another day back home. So I give them 40 hours in like three days. Mm. Um, and so I did a bunch of that. And I also, in church planning, not enough people valued that mission of church planning on their mission budget. So I had to educate people in mm. missions generally. Yeah. I led mission trips, so I was uh, taking two trips a year into Tijuana for uh, a week each, and then a broader one, whether it's uh, India, a uh, couple trips to India, three weeks apiece, a uh, couple weeks into Philippines at two weeks each, a couple trips, in, uh, not in the same year. Right. <laughs> one big, I was going to Mexico twice a year. Two weeks a year, and then I was going another two to three weeks somewhere else into uh, India, Philippines, uh, Ivory Coast, Cameroon. Um, yeah, so leading people and doing missions education and those things to sites where they did that as well, and then I would amplify it as well. Come home, encourage them to be on their missions team at church and understand that what church planning is about at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful evangelistic tool at home. Let's be a part of that. And then I'm recruiting church planters and uh, watching them do their thing, just coaching them how to go about that. Yeah. That's awesome. So uh, the question I have then is, how, so how do you end up at the tab? How did you, how'd you wind up here? And, mm -hmm. um, and I also happen to know of another ministry you're involved with mm -hmm. is uh, Tiny Builders. And so I'd love to... Mm -hmm. To talk that a little bit too of, of how did you wind up with Tab and, and what's up with Tiny Builders? Yeah, they fell together. Uh, mm -hmm. I had just finishing, uh, I, I'd 
taking my retirement benefits from uh, Social Security and from uh, Converge Retirement Funds uh, out of First Baptist here uh, in Manistee. And I was living in a church-owned home. And so now it's time for me to say to Kathy, you followed me all my career, including Detroit. Did I right. talk to her? About <laughs> yeah. So it goes, so Kath, it's yours. Where do you want to live? Do you want to get near family? And now they're downstairs in busy places and stuff like that. And so she says, I think we want to live in Manistee. So I was in a church-owned home in Manistee. And I had a retirement fund with a body of money to buy a house. And so we found the house for the exact same amount of money and bought it. And it's two blocks from the beach, and Kathy's life is the beach. Mm -hmm. Not to lay in the sand, but to walk and to appreciate the expanse. And it's an absolute part of her worship. It's her solitude. It's her reflection. It means the world to her. And so we found that place, and then I went to work for two weeks in a multi-site church, uh, a Genesis Church. Their first site was in uh, Petoskey, their second in Boyne City, their third in, third in Harbor Springs. So these are guys that watched when they planted, and they're good friends. And so the man in Boyne City wanted to uh, leave that ministry. And so I came alongside of him for one year as the interim. He was still so loved. He did half of the preaching. I did half of that. But, yeah, he was the heart for that church, and I was the admin, the area that he wasn't strongest at. And so I did that for a year until we got the new guy. And then I went to the Petoskey uh, campus, and I was interim um, executive pastor for a year while we sought for that guy and got that guy. Then I'm back home in Manistee, and I'm going, oh, there's no church I even want to attend. Forgive me, Manistee, for saying that. <laughs> when you've been in churches that are explosive in the church planning kind of movement stuff uh, and doing some of the best outreach, it's hard to settle for people that just want everything to be the same. And so I said to my family and best friends, pray for me, I'm in trouble. We live here now and there's no church I want to attend. That's just not me. I'm in trouble. And I don't have a project. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we remodeled this home we moved into in two months before I went, went to work up in Genesis Church. And I even painted the interior of my garage. So <laughs> I've completed that. Pro I need a project. I don't have a church. I don't have a project. I'm in trouble. Pray for me. Mm. Two weeks later, a guy said to me, the Tabernacle Church. Who? <laughs> From Buckley. Where? They're planting in Manistee. They have two staff members here. And uh, they're about to plant in Manistee. Whoa. I went online and I read the DNA of the Tabernacle Church. Hello. Hello. Barbarians, you know. <laughs> we take risks. We're, this is what, who we are, what we're about, the whole, the whole of the list. I think there's like 14 items or something. It's just like everyone grabbed me. Like, this is you. But I've help to evaluate these for church planters who don't have a, a person yet. And so I go, okay, is this aspirational? Do they aspire to this? Do they want to be this? And they're not? Mm -hmm. Or they do it? Well, first of all, I met with the two campus guys. And I'm, I'm starting to believe, oh, yeah, this is, this is where I want to be. Um, just two weeks, pray for me, and now I go, I think I got <laughs> my church. So I started attending in Buckley that winter. Uh, before we got started in Manistee, and uh, I've got my eyes on, is this aspirational or actual? And the people in Buckley, they're dominoes. That was most important to me, outreach. Outreach is also always major, man. I mean, I care for the church deeply. Mm -hmm. 
But if we're not after the next person, forget it. So that make disciples. Love God. Oh, yeah. Love it. Oh, yeah. Make disciples. Are we doing that? And part of that's our domino stuff here. We're helping people mm -hmm. grow closer to Christ, each of us taking our part in that. And I go, yeah, they got it. And they got it by church planting. They made an effort in Misik before. And uh, now they're moving on Manistee, having learned something. They put staff in first. I met two guys, and there's nothing else going <laughs> on. There's a group of family, uh, family ministry going on. So they're doing it right. They're doing it well. And, uh, yeah. And even cooler than that, not only did I find the church, a couple of weeks later, we got the keys. Here's your project. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> what Baby. A, what a project. <laughs> Bring on the sledgehammers. Let's do demo. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Gee, yeah. So that's cool. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. pretty wonderful. Now, when the campus started, when we started meeting, and, um, and so I can be campus pastor, uh, uh, excuse me, not, a care pastor. Uh, this is delicious, okay, really delicious. Because, yeah, I don't want to do any. I'm retired. I want to give my wife more. Mm -hmm. I want to be there for my family. I'm not done with Jesus, but he's still number one. But, yeah, I don't have to do the admin. I've done a lot of that. I work for district. I've gotten deep into admin policy. And, and yeah, no, uh, scheduling. Oh, yeah, no, you got it. <laughs> yeah. And matter of fact, when I work for the district, uh, I could live anywhere in mid-Michigan so I could get access to our lower peninsula churches, about 50 churches. But no, I don't want to live in Grand Rapids where the office is because I don't want to pick up their workload. Mm, yeah. Let me do my outreach. Leave me alone. So to be a care pastor and walk people through the one-on-one, -on -one, the giftedness, it's always been there. So to care for the church and to care for those outside the church or to work that turf, is that's what I'm about. But... Every place I've been a pastor, I do what's expected of the pastor, but is there something else God's calling me to in the community? So that's my question. Now, we've, we've started to meet locally, and I go, okay, what's that extra? What do I want to do for my community? What's the difference I want to make? And so I commit that to prayer, and, uh, you know, people are having a hard time with housing. The housing that's available is pretty ratty for some folks, and and that there's a cry across the whole region for housing, for additional housing, new housing. And uh, I know from studying around the the nation um, that tining is required for some people, especially lower incomes, low mm -hmm. incomes. Uh, poverty incomes and uh so that's where we start can we do anything for 30 percent of the average median income not just the middle income but 30 percent of that and uh so the campus gets started and a guy bob kennedy comes in and uh you know if you go to the annual meeting you'll hear about bob because he's nominated uh, to be on our leadership team for Tabernacle. But Bob comes in. Bob's a big guy, and he looks, so George, he says, <laughs> what are you into? I go, Bob. Mm. <laughs> uh, tiny housing. I'd like to see some tiny housing for the people in our community. And Bob goes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> he says, down in Arizona, I owned two quad units that we fit it out for low-income people. And I'd, I'd like to be a part of something like that up here. So here, here's my prayer, and here Bob comes in. It's like church planting. Mm -hmm. Now, I've got a big prayer that's going on. Once you've experienced something like I did in, in Victory Township for church planting, where you're running to keep pace with the Spirit, once you've seen something like that, 
God, I'd like to see that again in my lifetime. <laughs> so this is the focus of it. I don't know if it's it or not. I don't know if God's going to inhabit that or not. But here's Bob. <laughs> and then Bob and I made efforts looking at rehabbing industrial buildings, commercial space or whatever. Could we put that into a apartments and stuff like that. And I said to Bob from the beginning, if God's not in it, I'm going to quit. And we just, not, we had a committee, we had a group, we we're interfacing with some people in the community, but nothing's really happening, nothing's breaking. So I went to Bob <laughs> one Sunday in our foyer and I go, so Bob, I quit. I don't see God in it, I quit. And I walked away from him. Bob said later, I didn't know where you just quit from. <laughs> <laughs> that was on a Sunday. This stuff happens in our foyer. Oh, hello. Mm -hmm. I know you guys experienced that too. That was on a Sunday. On Monday, Nick Callison calls me. Nick had been after me for, I'm going to say, a year. He's been caring for a homeless guy. And he keep talking to me, hey, George, what can we do for her? And I go, I don't know. You can't help somebody that won't receive help, that doesn't want help. And he'd reach me every, every few months, and I'd give him the same line. But the day after I quit, Nick called me, and he says, George, I don't want to hear it. I want your help. Okay. <laughs> I called Bob and said, Bob, I'm back. <laughs> Nick wants help. Sunday. Monday, Nick calls me. I'm back. Tuesday, I'm meeting with Nick in his office. What do we do? I don't know. <sighs> but I think we should talk to Gary Buren. He's on the land bank. Bob, Gary said to Bob and I once, why would you guys go buy a property to rehab when we could give you one? We should probably talk to Gary, I said to Nick. So the next Sunday in the foyer, Sunday after I quit, <laughs> so Gary, have you got a house for us? He goes, no, we haven't had a house in a year. And uh, yeah, we haven't had a house in a year. The same week, Gary goes to a land bank meeting. He calls Nick and I. So we got a house and you guys can have it. And so uh, we go up and we see this house and we take it and it's ratty. It's ratty and we take it. And it's not tiny. It's a regular house. Uh, but I draw up a tiny plan where we've got, it's a single owned house, but a single resident can rent out rooms in their own house to help pay for it. So we design it with two efficiencies within it at 300 square feet each and we make it accessible. And uh, we apply even wheelchair turning radiuses and all that. So somewhere in its next hundred years will be used for that. We ended up too investing too much in the house to sell it to a low income person. So we sold it at its uh, market value. And that's in the bank right now, waiting for the next step. So God def definitely gave us this. And we completed it, and uh, so from there, where do we go? We don't know. We didn't know in the beginning. We don't know now. Mm -hmm. If God doesn't show up, we don't have a clue. So God showed up for that first step. Now, yesterday morning, I was in front of a, a township planning commission, you know, delivered them an eight-page concept just to see if that would work. And uh, it's hard sledding. Nobody wants tiny houses. You know? <laughs> so, it, but I'm not easily discouraged at all. Mm -hmm. We're just after the next steps and looking to see if God's in it. I've so, noticed. Not easily discouraged. <clears throat> oh, not at all. <laughs> Interesting, though. You said a couple of things I feel uh, are worth reiterating uh, in the moment of, all right, we didn't know then, we don't know now, but yet one of the quotes, one of the many quotes, by the way, uh, I need a bigger notepad next time we have you on here. 
Um, oh, I think we're wrapping it up, brother. <laughs> well, it was pray and see what God will do. Don't forget what God has done. You know, that's been the kind of the standard practice. And it's yeah. like, all right, well, that, I guess for me, it, it's just shocking to see that that's something you continue to, like, it's the same process. Yeah, yeah. Pray and see what God will do. Remember what he did. And then be patient and let God do what God does. Yeah. And for those, uh, you know, there are a handful of names thrown around there that maybe you don't know. Maybe you're not a tab person because there's a lot of folks that listen outside of here. Um, you'll at least get to meet Gary Buren. Uh, we'll be interviewing him later in July. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're really excited to hear his story and how he plays into this and maybe his perspective. And by then, we might even have another uh, update on tiny developers. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to fill in a couple of gaps for folks that didn't that aren't familiar with um, the way the tabernacle does our mm-hmm. kind of our outreach is we partner with ministries that are that whose burdens yeah. are obvious for them. Um, we don't claim to be the best at building tiny houses or <laughs> repairing houses or even benevolence or any of these things, but there are these organizations out there where God has pulled the heartstrings of a man like George. And the tabernacle comes alongside in whatever way seems appropriate. And we get to support and we get to see what God does in these ministries through people who have passions. And then we get to connect our, our congregation to those passions and, and let them catch fire. Because in a, a church our size, it's impossible to do all the good things we want to do. But what's really cool is to see so many people passionate about tiny houses. When you got started, I, that was the, the statement I started to make earlier. You standing up there explaining to us what this was. And you said, I just want to see God do one more great thing in my life. Yeah. Not for me, not, I just, I just want to see God do this again. I want to run with God again. And I just sat there and I'm like, I don't know who this dude is. I just know I want to be him when I grow up. <laughs> and if he can be that passionate at this point in his life. And then I started realizing who you were in scripture. Yeah. There's this guy, Caleb, in scripture. Did I say this on the last one? I couldn't remember. I don't know. You remember Caleb in scripture? Joshua and Caleb, they do the whole, like, we're going to go across the river, see the, see the, you know, promised land. And they're the ones that come back with a positive report. Everybody else like, it's big, it's scary, mm-hmm. it's hard. Yeah, can't do that. Um, I promise you, yeah. there were those in, in the room that were going, it's too big, it's too scary, it's too hard in half a dozen of the stories you told today. Mm-hmm. But there's got to be a Caleb. But what I love is near the end of that story, Caleb's about 80 years old. And God seemingly still working in that place. Mm. And they're distributing land. And and instead of just being like, all right, I'm good, Caleb's still got this fire. And that's what I, I I don't know, I see that in you. And and I'm grateful for it because, again, I'm a few years shy of where you're at. I'm sitting here just going, all right, if the passion started that early and it sustained this long, what's Mm. the system? What's the formula for that and and you've told us over and over again and if uh if you didn't hear it go re-listen to both of these podcasts because that alone is worth uh the Mm -hmm. price of the podcast Mm -hmm. to say the least but george thank you for tiny uh tiny developers is what it's called you can look it up on our website uh you can get connected to it a lot of different ways but thank you for it because yeah this is a, a tough economy for people to find homes yeah and the way that jesus did things was he met physical needs to be able to meet a spiritual need. And I know that you are, you've always got a new friend, whether they're connected in the jail system, or if you just found somebody that is still knocking on your office door saying, hey, I'm ready to accept Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, just uh, building tiny houses is one way to do it. And maybe somebody out there, one of our listeners has uh, got that next step for you. But I'll look forward to seeing whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, George, we appreciate you coming back on, making the, the drive to... Good old Buckley and the Ste, <laughs> um, but really appreciate it. Thanks for being uh, open and and just vulnerable and honest with us. And um, yeah, we uh, this has been a great two part episode. Uh, we, we I mean we already had people reaching out from part one that it was just incredible. So thank you for yeah. uh, for being real, yeah, and for for loving Jesus and running after him the way you do. He's great. Yeah, he great. really is. Yeah. So. Well, Tab family. Uh, we're going to wrap this one up. Uh, go back and listen to 145 if you haven't yet. Check out Tiny Builders. Do all the algorithm stuff too. Yeah, oh yeah. Five <laughs> stars, all that junk. Yeah, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. yeah, but 
Until next time, this is George, Martin, and Adam signing off. Mm-hmm.